We're now ready to start the last section we're going to discuss out of chapter two, applications of integration. So in this section, we're going to be dealing with what are called hyperbolic functions or hyperbolic trig functions. Have you ever wondered about the shape created by the spider web when you look at the strands of a spider web? Or about the shape when you look at a chain that's suspended under its own weight? Or maybe a power line, the poles connecting and then the wire hanging down between? Many students assume that these shapes are parabolas when in fact they are hyperbolic trig functions called a catenary. A catenary function is based on a hyperbolic trig function, which surprisingly is not actually a trig function at all. Instead, they are combinations of exponential functions, namely e to the x power and e to the negative x power. They get the name hyperbolic trig functions because many of their identities and their derivatives and integrals result in formulas that mirror those of the trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent, and so on. However, there are a few differences, so you'll have to be careful that you have the right formula when you're working with these hyperbolic trig functions. These types of functions come up a great deal, obviously, anytime you're suspending a cable or a wire under its own weight. So for example, the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a suspension bridge, has cables that are dropped in between the posts. That involves a catenary function, which is a hyperbolic trig function. It also turns up in studying elastic membranes, things that vibrate, like maybe the surface of a drum, your eardrum, all other kinds of shapes. And it also turns up in studying water waves and patterns like this. These are fascinating functions, but in terms of difficulty, this is probably one of the least difficult things we're gonna do in this entire course. So I hope you'll join me as we learn more about hyperbolic trig functions and their inverse functions. Let me share my screen with you so we can get started. We have several learning objectives, namely that we want to learn to identify hyperbolic trig functions or just hyperbolic functions. And that means we have to recognize these special combinations of e to the x power and e to the negative x power. We want to study their graphs so that we can learn more about the functions and also discover the basic identities, the relationships between them. Then we want to do some calculus with them. So we're going to have to evaluate and find formulas for the derivatives and the integrals of the hyperbolic trig functions. After we've studied hyperbolic trig functions, we're gonna turn our attention to the inverse hyperbolic trig function. In other words, swapping the X and Y variable and trying to solve again for Y. In that case, we also want to perform calculus with the inverse hyperbolic trig functions by finding their derivatives and associated integrals. Then we'll take a look at an application problem involving a catenary function which describes how a chain or wire is suspended between two fixed points under its own weight. Let's take a look now at defining these fascinating functions. As we've said before, they aren't actually trig functions at all. They are instead exponential functions, combinations of e to the x and e to the negative x but their derivatives and their integrals and the identities relating one function to another are very similar to the trig values for these particular objects. They're not exactly the same. There are a couple of key differences, namely the basic identity to trig identity is cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. But as we're going to see for a hyperbolic trig function, it's cosine squared or cosh squared minus cinch squared equal one. So instead of adding them together, we subtract beginning with cosine. Let's go ahead and talk about what they look like and how we pronounce these. So I've provided a table here so that you can kind of understand what we're looking at. To form the hyperbolic trig functions, we added an h to the end of the trig function. Now remember, these are not trig functions at all. They're exponential functions. 
the hyperbolic sign is pronounced cinch of x and it's e to the x minus e to the minus x all divided by two. Cosh, which is the hyperbolic cosine, is the same function but with a plus sign in the middle. So e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by two. Now you'll notice, of course, that this means that cosh of x, just like cosine, is going to be an even function. It's going to be y-axis symmetric. All right, when we look at tanch, and again, this is the hyperbolic tangent function, we find that it is actually the ratio of cinch to cosh, just like the trig function sine divided by cosine is tangent. We find that hyperbolic sine divided by hyperbolic cosine or cinch divided by cosh is hyperbolic tangent or tanch. The twos cancel and we get e to the x minus e to the minus x all divided by e to the x plus e to the minus x. And then we have their reciprocal functions, not inverse functions. Inverse functions switch the x and the y variable. They undo the function. Reciprocals turn the fraction upside down. When we're looking at hyperbolic cosecant, we pronounce it cosech, like co -se -sh. So cosech is the reciprocal of cinch, just as cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So we get two over e to the x minus e to the minus x. Hyperbolic secant we'll pronounce as seech, like c and then a ch sound at the end becomes the reciprocal of cosh. So you get two over e to the x plus e to the minus x. And hyperbolic cotangent or cotanch is simply the hyperbolic tangent function, tanch, turned upside down. So it's cosh divided by cinch. So you can see why they got the name hyperbolic trig functions because their identities are very similar to trig functions. And yet there are just a few differences. All right, so we've demonstrated their relationship to trig functions, but where did the hyperbolic come from? So we know why they kind of got the name of trig, even though they're not trig at all, they're totally exponential. So how did we get the hyperbolic? Well, if we think about the regular trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, cotangent, these are all related to the unit circle and the ratio of sides of a triangle on the unit circle. And the basic trig identity for trigonometric functions is sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. The hyperbolic trig functions, while not trig at all, are also related to a geometric shape, but this time it is to the unit hyperbola. When we think about the unit hyperbola, we end up with well, a hyperbola, right? You know the pattern. You've got something squared over a constant minus something squared over a constant equal one. I mean, that's the basic one. If it's a unit hyperbola, it's divided by one. So something squared over one minus something squared over one equal one. So it forms a one unit square box when you draw it. When we're looking at it, notice that we have the relationship here of cosh squared minus cinch squared. Cosh squared is e to the x plus e to the minus x all divided by two, and we're gonna square it. Now, if we square this, remember, please, please, please remember that when you square something that looks like a binomial and has two terms, you always get three terms, not two terms. Don't just square each individual term. You're gonna miss the product of the outside and the inside. So when I square this, e to the x times e to the x is e to the x plus x, which gives me e to the 2x, not x squared. And when I have e to the minus x times e to the minus x, minus x plus minus x gives me minus 2x. So I get e to the minus 2x. But when I multiply the two together and double, since I've got the same on the outside and inside, e to the x times e to the minus x, x plus negative x gives me zero. But e to the zero is not zero, it's one. So I get this on the outside and the inside, so I get a plus two in the middle. I get basically the same thing when I square cinch, 
However, my outside and inside products will be negative. So I get a negative two. And then of course, I want to subtract cinch squared from cosh squared. And when I do that, the e to the two x's cancel, the e to the minus two x's cancel, and I have two minus a negative two all divided by four, because I squared the two in the denominator. And that gives me four over four, which is one. This gives me that relationship on the basic unit hyperbola. So let's take a look at the unit hyperbola that we can see in this image here. What you're actually seeing, of course, is only the right arm of the hyperbola. There's another arm of the hyperbola, which would be, well, I'm probably not gonna do a great job of drawing it, but there's another arm of it over there, of course. I mean, it's a hyperbola, right? So we form a one box square here in the center, and then the graph approaches these asymptotes, all right? So it approaches them asymptotically. So when we're looking at this, this is the graph of x squared minus y squared equal to one. And if we allow x to be cosh and y to be cinch, then we get the relationship that cosh squared minus cinch squared equals one. And in doing that, we're allowing, of course, x to be cosh, y to be cinch, and then we're defining it in terms of a parameter, right? So this parameter t is going to vary. And as t varies, it's going to move us along this right arm of the unit hyperbola, right? So our basic identity is no longer Pythagorean. Instead, it's cosh squared minus cinch squared equals one. So make sure that you add the hyperbolic into the hyperbolic trig functions. Don't assume that it's cinch squared plus cosh squared equals one because that is not the case. All right, let's take a look at the graphs of these functions and see why they might have the particular behavior that they have. So we're gonna start with cosh of x and cosh of x is equal to e to the x plus e to the minus x all divided by two. So when I think about this, let's first off imagine what does e to the x look like? First off, let's just start with e to the x. So it does this, right? So as it approaches negative infinity, it approaches the x-axis. And as it approaches positive infinity, it goes off forever, right? So this, right? So this is the graph that you see here um, in green. Actually, this one is one half e to the x, right? So that I can get the divided by two in there. And then what about the graph of e to the minus x or one half e to the minus x. Well, that one has the reverse behavior, right? So this one, as I approach positive infinity, approaches the x-axis. But as I approach negative infinity, it goes off to infinity. So what's going to happen to this graph when I approach positive infinity? e to the x is going to go to infinity, but e to the minus x is going to get lower and lower and lower till it's practically zero. So we have something very large plus something that's practically zero. So as it goes to the right, cosh of x is going to approach infinity. And the cosh function is here in dark blue. So it goes up. Now what's going to happen when it gets to zero? At zero, e to the zero is one plus e to the zero is again one. And so I get two divided by two, which is one. So it's gonna go through the point zero one, which you can see here on the graph, all right? Now, what's gonna happen as we go to negative infinity? The graph of e to the x is gonna go down to zero, right? Because it has this, okay, e to the x. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what it looks like from your perspective. So e to the x here. So it goes down to zero. So this is practically zero, but e to the minus x does this, so it goes to infinity. So we have practically zero plus getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So as it goes to negative infinity, it's gonna go up again, which is gonna give it a sort of parabolic shape, but it is not a parabola. It is a hyperbolic trig function, like a catenary. So when we're looking at it, the graph of cosh is this dark blue right here. 
But notice how it approaches the graph of one half e to the minus x as I go to negative infinity, and the graph of one half e to the x as I go to positive infinity. It approaches those asymptotically, all right, getting closer and closer and closer. And then in the center, it crosses at 0, 1. Let's take a look at cinch. Now, you can also tell, of course, by looking at this, that it is obviously an even function. It does have y-axis symmetry, all right, which makes sense. Um, and I always can remember which one is cosh because it's the plus and it's got even axis symmetry. Now, another thing to notice about cosh here is cosh is always strictly positive. In fact, the lowest value it achieves is one. So cosh is a strictly positive value greater than equal to one at all points. Unless, of course, we shift it down, all right? So now let's look at cinch. So let's write up our equation for cinch. Cinch is e to the x minus e to the minus x, all divided by 2. So again, we're going to plot two graphs. This time, we're going to plot 1 half e to the x, which does this, right? And then we're going to plot minus 1 half e to the minus x, because we have a subtraction in the top. So basically, we're just splitting it into two fractions. And we're going to take a look at each. So 1 half e to the x does this, and when you do minus, you just rotate it over so that it does this. So you can see that we've got this orange graph right down here, which is negative one half e to the minus x, and then one half e to the x is again graphed in this sort of teal color. Now our graph of cinch is going to be in dark blue again. So Notice that these two graphs, as I move to the right, one half e to the x goes to infinity, but negative one half e to the negative x approaches zero. So I have very, very large minus or plus very, very small. So it becomes very, very large. Now, as I go to negative infinity, e to the x divided by two gets close to zero. So not zero, but practically zero. And the graph of negative e to the negative x over 2 approaches negative infinity. So I've got practically nothing minus a very large number. So it's going to be a very large negative number. So this goes down. So in this sense, we have sort of, well, it's kind of cubic in shape. It is sort of cubic, but it's not cubic because it does not achieve the same slope in here. It's close, but not exact. It is, however, an odd function. Imagine folding this down and then folding it over. It would lay on top of itself. So it does have origin symmetry. Um, and I always associate origin symmetry with negatives, and that helps me keep straight that I've got the negative there in the middle. Let's now take a look at another one. Oh, one last thing about cinch. Cinch takes on both positive and negative values. It takes on the entire real number line over its domain. So it's defined from negative infinity to infinity for domain, but the range is also negative infinity to infinity. Now contrast that with cosh, which has the same domain, negative infinity to infinity, but the range is closed one to infinity. Much different, right? We're going to use these graphs in order to graph coseach and seach, respectively. So seach, of course, is the reciprocal of cosine. So this one becomes 2 over e to the x plus e to the minus x. And coseach is the reciprocal of cinch, which becomes 2 over e to the x minus e to the minus x. We don't work with these quite as often, at least in this class. You will see them coming up, though, in the real world, so you do want to make sure that you understand the formulas. So notice that Seach has the same domain, negative infinity to infinity, um, but the range just goes from open 0 to 1, all right? So the range is somewhat different, right? Now, if we're looking over here at Coseach, Notice that it actually leaves out zero from the domain. So the domain does not include zero. It's got a vertical asymptote there. And the reason, of course, if you come up to the graph of cinch, is that cinch passes through the origin. So when x is zero, cinch is zero. 
But if you take the reciprocal of zero, well, then you've got one divided by zero, which is not defined. So it's going to give you um, a vertical asymptote in the graph, right? And we have two last graphs, which is tanch and cotanch. Tanch to me reminds me of a cube root function. So sort of like this, um, like someone doing the American crawl, right? They're swimming and they kind of get in that motion right here. All right, so, but unlike the cube root of X, it does not increase forever. So the range is actually restricted to being between negative one and one. The domain is all real numbers, but the range is between negative one and one, and it approaches one and negative one like an asymptote. So it's actually um, negative one open to one open. When you look at cotanch, anywhere that tanch achieved a zero, you're going to get a vertical asymptote. So we have a vertical asymptote when x is zero. And then right here, if tanch is small, the reciprocal is going to be large. So it makes sense that this is approaching the y-axis as an asymptote. And then as it gets closer and closer to one, the reciprocal will get closer and closer to one, but from above, because these are numbers slightly less than one, so their reciprocals are slightly more than one. And we have the same similar relationship on the left. So one of the most important things that I want you to get from the shape of the graphs is that cosh is always strictly positive and greater than or equal to one. Cosh is also an even function, and cinch is an odd function. So if you can keep those two in your mind, then I'll be happy. Let's go ahead and talk about some of our trig, hyperbolic trig identities. Now, I put, there are many, many more, and in your homework sets, you'll undoubtedly be working more of these, and maybe even some of these. But I've put some of the basic ones up here so that you can see them. Cosh of negative x is equal to cosh of x. This is just like the cosine function. Cosine of negative x is cosine of x. So this one is just like the trig identity. Cinch of negative x is negative cinch of x. Again, just like the trig function. Sine of negative x is negative sine of x because it's an odd function. <laughs> cosh of x plus cinch of x equals e to the x. Well, the trig functions don't have any relationship like this, so this isn't related to a trig function, but it should sort of make sense to you if you're doing e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by 2 plus e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by 2, you're going to end up with 2 e to the x divided by 2 or just e to the x. Right? And that's how you would prove that identity. Then we've got cosh of x minus cinch of x is e to the minus x, because then the e to the x's would cancel, and you would get double of the e to the minus x's. Here is our hyperbolic basic identity, cosh squared minus cinch squared equals 1. And again, that's because it's based on the unit hyperbola. This one is not like the trig functions. So let's go ahead and highlight the ones that are not like trig functions. All right, so let's make a note, not like trig functions. All right, so when we look at these, what about the next one? The next one has one minus tanch squared equals c squared. Well, this is not like a trig identity either. The trig identity is one plus tangent squared equals secant squared. So this one is also quite different from the trig functions. And then we've got cotanch squared minus one equals cosec squared, which I believe is also not like our trig functions because cotangent, we would divide um, cosine by sine. So we would get cotangent squared plus one equal to cosecant squared. So this one is also different. Now, I'm not 100% sure about the sine one. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think the sine one is similar, but the last one is definitely not. The last one is cosh of x plus or minus y equals cosh of x, cosh of y plus or minus cinch of x, cinch of y. 
this one is definitely backwards to what it is in the trig identities. For cosine, cosine of x plus y is cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y. So these signs get turned upside down. If that's a plus, that's a minus, that's a minus, that's a plus for trig functions. For cosh, they mirror. So if that's a plus, that's a plus. If that's a minus, that's a minus. And this is not like the trig function identities. All right. So we've identified some here that are definitely not like their trig ones. And it looks like I did pick up all of them. And I've gone ahead and written out the hyperbolic trig identity on the left and the regular trig identity on the right. And I've highlighted in red what the sign difference is in each of these cases. So you can see right here that the signs do not match what we have on the left. All right, and last one. All right, so you'll see on the left menu down here that most of the work we have to do in this section is really examples. There are lots and lots of examples. So let's get to it. Let's go ahead and simplify the cosh of two natural log of x. Now, cosh of x is e to the x plus e to the minus x all divided by two. Now, if I have two natural log of x, one thing I might do, because I know cosh is exponential, is I might go ahead and rewrite two natural log of x as the natural log of x squared, right? Remember, you can pull the two inside the natural log. So let's go ahead and apply that here. This becomes the cosh of the natural log of x squared. Remember that from college algebra. So then I can say that this is equal to e to the natural log of x squared plus e to the minus the natural log of x squared, all divided by two. Now, if the e and the natural log are touching and there's nothing in between, then I can go ahead and say that they undo each other because they're one-to-one -one inverse functions. So e to the natural log of x squared, is just going to give me x squared. Now the next one, they are not touching because I've got this negative in between. So I need to pull the negative up into the power just like I pulled the two into the power. So this next one becomes e to the natural log of x to the negative two and all this is divided by two. And then this would give me x squared plus x to the negative two divided by two. And that would be my final result. So oddly enough, the cosh of two natural log of x is some kind of, well, it's a rational function, right? I mean, I could simplify this out a little bit um, and get rid of the x to the negative two by multiplying by x squared over x squared. But it is in fact a rational function, right? So it's not even a hyperbolic trig function anymore. Okay. And you can see that I have these solutions down there highlighted in yellow. Let's take a look at example two. In example two, we want to translate each of these three different expressions in terms of the exponential functions that represent cosh and cinch. So I've got the two formulas for cosh and cinch here. Go ahead and pause the video, work these out, then turn the video back on and we'll compare our results. So let's compare our results. In order to simplify the first one, two cosh of the quantity natural log of x, I replace x in the definition of cosh with natural log of x. Then I multiply that whole result by two. The two will cancel the two in the denominator and I get e to the natural log of x, which is x, plus e to the negative natural log of x. I can't have them undo each other until they are touching one another without the negative in between. Because it is a factor on natural log, I can pull it in as a power on the answer part. So this becomes e to the natural log of x to the negative one power. Then the e to the natural log undo each other and I get x to the negative one or x plus one over x. The second one, cosh of four x plus cinch of four x, 
I replace the x in the exponential definitions with 4x for both, and then I add the two together. Since I have a common denominator of two, I can slide them together. e to the 4x plus e to the 4x gives me 2e to the 4x's, plus e to the minus 4x minus e to the minus 4x, they cancel, and I get 2e to the 4x divided by two, or just e to the 4x. That leaves us one left to take a look at, which is the one that we see here, which I've done in gray. And when I'm looking at this particular one, I'm going to replace the x in the exponential definition with 2x for both cosh and cinch, and then I'm going to subtract the cinch representation from cosh. So I have e to the 2x plus e to the minus 2x all over 2 minus the quantity e to the 2x minus e to the minus 2x over 2. Now, the second one, I have a common denominator, so I can slide them all together, but I've got to, to, to distribute the negative that is the subtraction between them. So it gives me e to the 2x plus e to the minus 2x minus e to the 2x plus e to the minus 2x over 2. So the e to the 2x's cancel, and I get 2 e to the minus 2x over 2, or just e to the minus 2x. So again, this is relatively straightforward, not as difficult as many of the things that we'll do in this class. Most of the things we do in Calculus 2 are, well, let's face it, they're pretty hard. Um, this is probably your easiest section out of the entire course. Let's now take a look at example three, and um, then we'll go on to example four. In example three, we want to prove that the cinch of 2x is 2 cinch of x cosh of x. This one is exactly like the trig identity, that the sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. So this one, again, exactly matches the trig one. So there are a few that are different, but many of them are the same, all right? So make sure you have your formulas handy as you're going through these and highlight the ones that are different so you make sure that you don't incorrectly use a formula. We'll need the formulas for cinch and cosh. Go ahead and apply this now and see if you can come up with the result. Then turn the video back on and we'll work it together. This one can be a little tricky. There are a couple things here that students tend to want to do that are not allowed. For example, one thing students want to do is they want the two being multiplied by cinch and cosh to cancel both the twos in the denominator. Well, that's not how you multiply numbers. This is not addition or subtraction in between, so this is not the distributive property. This is just the associative property. You can multiply the two by one of them, but then it's gone. And so you still have a two in the denominator. When you multiply the numerators together, go ahead and use the distributive property or the FOIL process, first, outer, inner, last, that we use in the United States. This gives you e to the x times e to the x, or e to the 2x, x plus x. Then you have e to the x times e to the minus x, which of course would give you e to the zero, which is just the number one. And then you have a minus e to the x, e to the minus x, which would give you a minus one, but one minus one, they're gonna cancel each other out. And then the last one gives you a negative e to the negative x, times e to the negative x, which is gonna give you a negative e to the negative two x. Negative x plus negative x is negative two x. And that gives you e to the two x minus e to the minus two x over two, which is the definition of cinch. So what I did in proving this identity was I took the more complicated side, the longer side, and performed operations that I knew to be true until I reached the left-hand side, and now it's proved because I have the right-hand side equal to the left-hand side. Let's take a look now at example four, which is a little bit more challenging. For example four, you're going to need the identities that tanch is cinch divided by cosh, and the hyperbolic identity, cosh squared minus cinch squared equals one. We're told that cinch of x is 3 fourths. We want to find the values of cosh and tanch. Now, tanch can take on both positive or negative values, but between negative 1 and 1. But cosh cannot. Cosh, remember, is always strictly positive greater than or equal to 1. So when we use this um, 
hyperbolic identity, cosh squared minus sin squared equal one, we're going to have to solve for cosh, which normally would give us a plus or minus. But we know from the graph of cosh that it's always strictly positive. So go ahead and pause the video here, try to work this one out, and then turn the video back on and we'll check our results. So in this problem, I started with the hyperbolic identity, cosh squared minus sin squared equals one. And I solved it for cosh squared, getting one plus sin squared. And I took the square root of both sides, but acknowledging that cosh is strictly positive, I only took the positive root. And I replaced sin with three fourths and squared it to get nine sixteenths, got a common denominator of 16, and that gave me 25 sixteenths under the root, which gives me five over four. Now the definition of tanch is cinch divided by cosh, and so I get three-fourths divided by five-fourths, which is three-fifths. All right, now that we've discussed the hyperbolic trig functions, we want to go ahead and move on into talking about the inverse hyperbolic functions. In order to talk about the inverse hyperbolic functions, we want to go back to the graphs. Remember that inverse functions swap the variables x and y, and then we try, if we can, to solve for y again. So this is, in trig terms, arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, the angle whose tangent is a number. Then, in this case, we're going to be looking at the x equal cosh of y, all right? So the inverse cosh of um, x is equal to y. So when we're looking at these, the first thing we want to do is figure out if we have to restrict the domain. Remember that when we did inverse trig functions, we had to restrict the domain of all of them because they're not one-to-one -one over their entire domain. However, notice that while cosh is not one-to-one, -one, cinch is a one-to-one -one function over its entire domain. So we can simply take the inverse function of cinch without having to worry about it, and then the inverse function will still be a function. One-to-one -one translates to one-to-one -one in the inverse. That's not true for cosh, and it's not true for siege. These are not one-to-one -one over the entire domain, so we're going to have to take part of it that is. Since it is y-axis symmetric, we could either take the part from negative infinity to zero, or the part from zero to infinity. And being human beings, we prefer positives, so we're going to take the part from zero to infinity. Let's look at the other graphs and see what kind of changes we have to make there. So again, Seach, like Kosh, since they're reciprocal functions, is y-axis symmetric and not one-to-one. -one. It is a function. It passes the vertical line test, but it does not pass the horizontal line test. So again, we're going to take the region from zero to infinity for our value of the inverse or Seach function. Coseach, however, is a one to fun function. It passes the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. We don't need to mess with the domain of inverse coseach. Let's take a look at the last two, tanch and cotanch. Tanch, is it a one-to-one -one function over its domain? Yes, it's a function. It passes the vertical line test. And even though these get very close to negative one and one, they never go totally horizontal. So it does pass the horizontal line test. So it is a one-to-one -one function over the entire domain. So we can simply take the inverse function without restricting the domain. Same is true for cotanch. Now that we've discussed all of that, let's go back and talk about what these are going to be. So the only two we have to restrict are the two that were y-axis symmetric. That's cosh and siege. And we'll restrict them from zero to infinity. So here's the derivation and the definition of an inverse hyperbolic trig function. And you may recall from what we did when we were looking at inverse trig functions that the inverse trig functions weren't actually trig functions at all. They were algebraic functions. So don't be surprised to find algebraic functions here. We're going to start with saying that y equals the inverse hyperbolic sine function. 
So inverse cinch of X. So when we're looking at that, what does that mean? By definition of an inverse, that means that the cinch of Y equals X. Again, we've swapped the X and the Y variable. So once we have cinch of Y equals X, we can use the definition of cinch to rewrite this as cinch of Y, which equals X, equals E to the Y minus E to the minus Y divided by two. Now we want to try to solve this for Y. So we're gonna apply some algebra. We're gonna move the two to the left to multiply by X. And then we're going to move all of our terms to the same side of the equation. So we get E to the Y minus two X minus E to the minus Y equals zero. Now what we wanna do is we wanna to try to get an equation. Now this is very tricky algebra, all right? It took someone weeks, months to come up with this. This was not something that happened overnight. So if you look at this and say, gosh, I would never have thought to do that. Well, neither would I. Most of us only think to do it because we've been shown this technique before. So what they're gonna do here is they're gonna try to build something. We need to solve for Y, but I've got three terms and they're not alike, so I can't combine any of them. So, well, when we have three terms, we tend to wanna try to do the quadratic formula, but these are not quadratic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply an algebraic trick or technique by multiplying through by another e to the y so that I can get an equation that is quadratic in form. So e to the y times e to the y is e to the 2y, which is the same thing as e to the y quantity squared, all right? And then I'm gonna multiply the minus two X by E to the Y. So I get minus two X times E to the Y. And then when I multiply E to the minus Y by E to the Y, minus Y plus Y is zero, E to the zero is one. <laughs> so I get minus one equals zero. Now this is something that is quadratic in form, all right? So I've got something squared minus two X times the something minus Y. And so we simply make a U substitution, U squared minus two X U minus one equals zero. Now U of course is gonna be equal to E to the Y, all right? And I'm eventually gonna to wanna to write Y equals, right? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna identify that the coefficient of u squared is one, the coefficient of u is negative two x, and the constant term is negative one. And then I can apply the quadratic formula. I know, it's kind of neat, right? I mean, it's, wow, I mean, who came up with this? So I've got the opposite of b, which is two x, plus or minus square b, so I get four x squared, minus four times a times c, a is one, c is negative one, so I get a plus four. So I have four X squared plus four, which I can write as four times X squared plus one, all divided by two times A, which is just two. I, I don't know why I didn't just write two on the next one. And then I have two X plus or minus. Now, once I've factored the radicand, what's under the radical into four times the quantity X squared plus one, I can split them here into the square root of four times the square root of X squared plus one. I'm allowed to squit, split over multiplication and division, but not addition and subtraction. So the square root of four gives me a two on the outside. I can't do anything about the X squared plus one because of the plus. But then I've got a common factor of two in the numerator and denominator. So I get X plus or minus the square root of X squared plus one. All right, now, why did we discard the negative one? When we discard the negative one, first realize that if I allowed the negative one to be here, it would actually end up negative, right? Because the absolute value of uh, the square root of X squared would be absolute value of X, but I've got a plus one, which makes it ever so slightly larger than X. So if I had a minus here, it would end up negative. But based on my original equation, I know that cinch of y is equal to x. And I know that u is equal to e to the y. And if u is equal to e to the y, e to a power 
is always strictly positive. So I can't allow that negative arm to come into the quadratic formula. So it's got to be the strictly positive one. E to a power is always, po I mean, you're taking 2.718281828459, blah, 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 and you're raising it to a power. You can't make a positive number turn negative by raising it to any kind of power. It's always going to be strictly positive. So this has to be with the plus. So this tells me then that u is equal to x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. But u is equal to e to the y. So I have u equal to this e to the y equal to this. Now, how am I going to solve for it? In order to solve for y, I need to, x, I need to take the logarithm of the left side of the equation. So basically what I've achieved down here is, and I'm erasing and writing, e to the y equals x plus the square root of x squared plus one. And then in order to find out what y is, I apply the one-to-one -one function. So this is going to give me, in this case, the natural log of e to the y. The natural log and e to the y are right next to each other. They're one-to-one -one inverse functions. They undo each other. So I get y equals the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. All right? And this is, well, what is y again? <laughs> Let's go right back up to the top where we had y y was the inverse hyperbolic sine function. So this is the definition of the inverse hyperbolic trig function or sine, all right? So it's not totally algebraic because we have natural log of this and that makes it transcendental. Um, the argument part is algebraic, but then we have to apply the natural log, which is a transcendental function. All right, here are the formulas for the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. And notice that they all involve natural log because when we get down to the end, we have e to the y and we have to take the natural log to solve for y. So you'll find that they're all very, very similar. Um, in fact, when you look at the inverse tanch and the inverse cotanch, they're very, very similar. It's only the denominator that has opposite signs. So they're quite similar to each other. Um, I don't expect my students to ever memorize these. You'll have to check with your instructor to see if they expect you to memorize them. Here are the graphs of the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. Notice that Kosh and Sish are restricted to zero to infinity because they were y-axis symmetric, so they weren't one-to-one -one functions. So we had to cut off the part that repeated the range values, and we're just using from zero to infinity. But the others, of course, were one-to-one, so we simply find their inverse functions. And again, I don't typically expect my students to remember all of that. All right, so now let's go ahead and apply these formulas. So I want you to go ahead and take a look at examples five and six. In example five, I want you to find the inverse tanch of one half, all right? So when we're doing this, we're gonna use the formula for arc tanch. And again, you can write arc tanch. That's my preferred notation because I know when I see that arc, I know it's an inverse function. It's not the reciprocal. So we want to apply this function right here to come up with a simplified version of arctanch of one half. And down here, we want to come up with a simplified version of arccinch of three. So go ahead and pause the video to work these out, then turn the video back on and we'll work them together. So note that you can use both the inverse function notation with the negative one in the power position or you can use the arc notation. I prefer the arc notation. I find that students get less confused about whether it's a reciprocal or an inverse function when they use the arc notation. So arc tanch of one half, we replace x in the formula with one half. One plus a half is three halves. One minus a half is one half. The twos cancel and we get one half the natural log of three, which you could leave it like that. Or you could write it as the natural log of three to the one half, 
The one half power is the square root. So you could also write it as the natural log of the square root of three, which is about 0.5493. For example, six, we have arc sinh of three. So we replace x in the formula with three and we get the natural log of three plus the square root of three squared plus one. Three squared is nine plus one is 10. So we get the natural log of the quantity three plus the square root of 10. Now that we've done all of these things, we want to start the calculus portion. This is a calculus class. So we've just defined the hyperbolic trig functions and we've defined the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. We've looked at their graphs and talked about their relationships and identities, but now we want to perform calculus with them. So we need to learn about their derivatives and their integrals, antiderivatives. So to find the derivative of the hyperbolic trig function, we simply write them in their exponential form and then find the derivative using normal calculus operations. Let's go ahead and take a look at cinch. If we want to find the derivative of cinch of x, we write it as e to the x minus e to the minus x all divided by 2. The 1 half is a constant factor, which as you know can be pulled out of the derivative. So we have 1 half times the derivative of e to the x minus e to the minus x. But when you take the derivative of the exponential, you get the exponential and chain rule multiplied by the derivative of the power. So the derivative of e to the x is still e to the x. The derivative of e to the minus x is minus e to the minus x, but I already had a negative, so now I have a double negative, and that will give me plus e to the minus x. But hang on, I know what that is, that's cosh. So it turns out that the derivative of cinch is cosh, which does mirror the trig identity that the derivative of sine is cosine. In example seven, I want you to go ahead and develop the formula for cosh and tanch. Don't be surprised when one of these does not turn out the way you think it might. Go ahead and pause the video now to work it out and then turn the video back on and we'll check our results. Notice that when we take the derivative of cosh, we can pull the one half out and we get e to the x minus e to the minus x. In other words, we get cinch. We do not get negative cinch, which is what we would have gotten for the trig functions. This is one of those identities that is not the same as the trig. The derivative of cinch is cosh and the derivative of cosh is cinch, not negative cinch. When you apply the rule to tanch, you could do it in exponential form, but it is more difficult. Instead, what I chose to do was to write it as cinch divided by cosh, and then to apply the quotient rule. So I have cosh of x times the derivative of cinch minus cinch of x times the derivative of cosh divided by cosh squared. The derivative of cinch is cosh, so I get cosh squared. And the derivative of cosh I just found was cinch, so I get minus cinch squared, but this is that hyperbolic identity on the unit hyperbola. Cosh squared minus cinch squared is one, which gives me one over cosh squared, but one over cosh is the definition of cinch. So I have cinch squared of x. This does meet what I would have expected based on the trig identities. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, the derivative of tanch is seach squared. But notice that cosh does not follow the pattern. And as you might expect, seach will not follow the pattern either. Here are the formulas with the chain rule built into them. Notice that while they're similar, there are two primary differences. The derivative of cosh is positive cinch, and the derivative of seach is negative seach tanch times du dx. So the ones that don't meet our expectations are the very ones that we had to restrict the domain in order to get a one-to-one -one function to find the inverse, cosh and seach. The two that have y-axis symmetry, their derivative formulas do not meet our expectations. Once we've done that, we're ready to go ahead and work some examples. So in example eight, we want to take the derivative of tanch of x squared plus three x. 
In example nine, we want to take the derivative of one divided by cinch of x quantity squared, which you could also write as cinch of x quantity to the negative two power. Then we want to be able to work example 10, which is the cinch of natural log of x. Go ahead and work out these four different examples, then turn the video back on and we'll work through the results together. Let's go ahead and take a look at these three different examples, eight, nine, and 10. Remember, we're going to have to use the chain rule if we have a function composed with a function, which we do in all three of these. We have x squared plus 3x composed with tanch of x. So in this case, we're going to take the derivative of the outside function, tanch, which gives us each squared, frees the inside at x squared plus 3x, then multiply by the derivative of the inside, x squared plus 3x. That gives us 2x plus 3, the quantity, times each squared of x squared plus 3x. Again, this is not going to be the most difficult section out of this course, as long as you apply the formulas correctly and are careful. Then we want to take the derivative of 1 divided by cinch of x quantity squared. We can rewrite this as cinch of x to the negative 2 and apply the chain rule, giving us negative 2 cinch of x to the negative 3 times the derivative of cinch of x. Now, the cinch of x to the negative 3 can drop it to the denominator as cinch cubed of x. And yes, it is acceptable to put the power in between the hyperbolic trig function and the variable. And then the derivative of cinch is cosh, so we get negative 2 cosh of x over cinch cubed of x. You could, if you wanted, apply some of the identities to this one, writing cosh of x over cinch of x, which is cotanch of x and 1 over cinch squared, which is cosich squared of x, to rewrite it as negative 2 cotanch x cosich squared of x. Whether or not you do so is totally up to you. It's a matter of personal preference. In our last example, we want to take a look at the derivative of cinch of the natural log of x. So we take the derivative of the outside function cinch to get cosh of natural log of x, times the derivative of natural log of x, which is 1 over x. This gives us cosh of the natural log of x divided by x. Let's go ahead now and talk about integrals of hyperbolic trig functions. Once we have the differentiation formulas, finding the antiderivative is just a matter of working backwards. Notice that the ones that do not meet our expectations are the ones for cosh, or rather for cinch and um, seach, all right? So the antiderivative of cinch is cosh, not negative cosh. And the integral of seach tanch is negative seach, not seach. But otherwise, these meet our expectations of what we have. And again, just make sure you have the formulas handy to be sure you're applying them correctly. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the next two examples. In example 11, we have cinch cubed of x times cosh of x. We can do this one with a u substitution, letting u be cinch of x, and then its derivative is cosh of x dx. So you can do a u substitution on example 11. In example 12, we have seach squared of 3x dx. We know what the integral of seach squared is. It's tanch of u. In this case, we do a u substitution where u is 3x, and then we simply integrate seach squared of u as tanch of u. Go ahead and pause the video to work these out and turn the video back on so we can work through them together. So I make my u substitution in number 11 to allow u to be cinch of x so that cosh of x dx is du. This gives me the integral of u cubed du, which is 1 fourth u to the fourth plus a constant. Back substituting for u, I get 1 fourth cinch to the fourth of x plus c, or cinch of x quantity to the fourth power. Let's take a look now at example 12. In 12, I allow the u to be 3x so that du is 3dx or dx is du over 3. 
So this is going to introduce a constant factor of one third. This gives me seach squared of u times du over three, or one third seach squared of u du. This becomes one third tanch of u plus a constant, which becomes one third tanch of three x plus c when I back substitute for u. We've now done calculus with the hyperbolic functions. We now want to do calculus with the hyperbolic inverse functions. Let's go ahead and take a look at the inverse functions. Remember that we are going to allow y to equal the arc cinch of x. And by definition of the inverse, that means cinch of y equals x, swapping the x and the y variable. We want to take the derivative of both sides so that we can find the derivative of arc cinch. When we take the derivative of cinch of y, we get cosh of y dy dx. We're using implicit differentiation because y does not match the differential dx. So we introduce a factor of dy dx on the left. The derivative of x with respect to x is just the number one. So we get cosh of y dy dx equals two one. Now we're gonna use our basic hyperbolic identity that cosh squared of x minus cinch squared of x is equal to one to replace cosh of y. Remember that cosh is a strictly positive function unless it's been shifted down. It's always greater than or equal to one. So when we solve the basic hyperbolic identity for cosh, we get the positive root of one plus cinch squared of x. Then we can replace this in our example up here by replacing cosh of y with root one plus cinch squared of y. However, remember that we defined cinch of y to be x when we swapped our variables. So this gives us one over the square root of one plus x squared for dy dx. Y of course is the arc cinch function, the inverse hyperbolic sine function. And it turns out to be one over one plus x squared. We can apply a similar technique to find all six of them. And here is the formula for all six with the chain rule built in. We've already developed the formula for arc cinch of u as one over root one plus u squared times du dx. Notice that the arc cosh um, derivative gives us something similar, but one over square root of u squared minus one times du dx. The derivative of arc tanch is one over one minus u squared du dx. And shockingly, the derivative of arc cotanch is the same. The only way you'll know the difference is by the limitations on the function that's involved. And then we have the derivative of arc seach, which is negative one over u square root of one minus u squared du dx. And finally, the derivative of arc coseach at the bottom which is the only one that has the absolute value involved. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the domains and ranges for the inverse trig functions so that we can figure out which one is which. When we're looking at the function cinch of x, the domain was negative infinity to infinity and the range was as well. Cosh of x, of course, oops, and I've got an error here. If we're looking at um, arc cosh of x, we had to restrict and we swapped our domain and range. So our range is zero to infinity and our domain was one to infinity because the range of cosh is one to infinity. When we look at tanch of x, we swapped again the domain and range. So we get domain negative one to one and range of negative infinity to infinity. Now let's take a look at cotanch. Remember that the derivatives of tanch and cotanch are the same formula, but they have different domains. When you look at the domain of arc tanch, it's between negative one and one. And when you look at the derivative or the domain of arc cotanch, it's outside of negative one to one. 
So you'll know which one you're dealing with by knowing what the domain of the particular function you're looking at is. So if it's between negative one and one, it must be arctant. And if it's outside of negative one to one, so negative infinity to negative one, one to infinity, then it must be arccotant. We have three examples to work here, and I've provided the formulas. So the first one is the derivative of arccosh of the quantity 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. And the formula for derivative of arccosh is right here. You will need to apply the chain rule where u is your 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. Then in example 14, we have the derivative of cotanch of the negative 1 of 4x to the fifth all cubed. So we're going to have three layers deep here. The outside function is the third power. So the derivative of the third power is three times the inside squared. And then the next layer is arc cotanch. So we'll use the derivative formula for arc cotanch, freeze the four x to the fifth. And then the inside layer is the four x to the fifth. Be very careful on the chain rule on number 14. Number 15 is a composition of arc cinch with cosh. So again, we're going to apply the formula for the derivative of the outside function, arc cinch first, freeze the inside at cosh of x, then multiply by the derivative of cosh, which is cinch. Go ahead and pause the video to work these three out and then turn the video back on and we'll take a look at the three together. These are relatively straightforward. That doesn't mean easy, but they are relatively straightforward if you have the formula. In this case, we take the derivative of arc cosh first by applying the formula one over the square root of u squared minus one, where u is three x squared plus two x minus one. You could multiply it out, but if you do that, you'll sort of lose the structure of the problem. So I recommend that you just leave it squared so that you can see the structure. This, of course, is a matter of personal preference, and you may want to check with your instructor. Then you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside using chain rule, which gives us 6x plus 2 for the numerator, and the square root of the quantity 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 squared minus 1 under the square root. Now let's take a look at 14, the derivative of arc cotanch of 4x to the fifth all raised to the third power. So I went ahead and did this one in three steps, unpeeling it one layer at a time. The outside layer is the third power, so that's three times arc cotanch of 4x to the fifth, all raised to the second power. Then I multiply by the derivative of the inside, arc cotanch of 4x to the fifth. When I do that, I'm going to get the derivative of arc cotanch, which I use the formula 1 over 1 minus u squared, which gives me 1 over 1 minus quantity 4x to the fifth all squared. Now, 4x to the fifth squared will give me 16x to the tenth. But then I have to multiply by the inside of that function, the derivative, which is 4x to the fifth. And the derivative of that is 20x to the fourth. So putting it all together, I get 60x to the fourth times the quantity arc cotanch of 4x to the fifth, all squared. And then the whole thing divided by 1 minus 16x to the tenth. We have one last example to work on the derivative formula, which is the derivative of arc cinch of the cosh of x. So again, I want to apply the derivative formula for arc cinch, which is 1 over the square root of 1 plus u squared where u is cosh. It's tempting to want this to be the basic hyperbolic identity, but it is not. Cosh squared minus cinch squared equals one, so you never get cosh squared plus one. So this must be left alone. Then we multiply by the derivative of cosh, which is cinch, and we simply get that ratio there. Now that we've done the derivatives, we should be able to find the antiderivatives or integrate. I'm not going to go through all of these, but we are instead going to um, represent them in their forms here. 
Notice that these are all ones that can be done with trig substitution instead so that you can get them in terms of the inverse trig functions. And you can also do them in terms of the inverse hyperbolic functions. So these can be done in terms of either trig substitution or as the hyperbolic functions. In most online calculators, you're going to find that they're going to use trig substitution and you're not often going to see them solve for the hyperbolic function, though that is equivalent. In this case, we're simply taking the reverse operation of the derivative and coming up with the integrands um, and the integrals. We have three last examples to work. Let's work these one at a time. So in example 16, we have the formula one over x squared minus four, which we could also do trig substitution with u being secant. In this case, notice that we're restricted to x greater than two so that we can make sure that our value in the radical is strictly positive and not zero. We're gonna apply the formula that one over the square root of u squared minus one is simply arc cosh. So the antiderivative of that is arc cosh plus a constant. In this case, what we need to do first is we have to have this constant in the denominator under the radical as a one. And right now we have a four. So what we want to do first with this one is we want to rewrite it as one over the square root of four factored out of x squared divided by four minus one with respect to the differential dx. By factoring the four out, I've got two factors multiplied together. So I can split the radical between four and the quantity x squared over four minus one. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to rewrite this one as the integral of one over two, the square root of x over two squared minus one. And now I have it in a form that matches the formula that I want to apply, u squared minus one. So we're going to make u be equal to x over two. And then of course, we're going to have to find du which is going to be, um, well, let me go ahead and move this over to the side so I have a little more room. U is x over two, so du equals one half dx. So dx, well, actually I have a one half dx because I have the one half and I have the dx. So when I substitute, this is going to become the integral of one over the square root of u squared minus one du, which is equal to inverse cosh function of u plus a constant. Get my constant in there. And then I back substitute what u is. So I get either arc cosh or the inverse cosh function of x over two plus a constant. All right, so you can write it in either form. Let's go ahead and look at number 17 now. In number 17, we have something similar, but we have the formula one over one minus u squared, which will either give us tanch of u or cotanch of u, depending on whether u is between negative one and one, in which case it gives us arc cotanch, or outside of negative one to one, in case it gives us arc cotanch. So when we're looking at our integral, one over the square root of one minus e to the two x, we need to write it in the form of something squared. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to want to rewrite the original integral as one over the square root of one minus e to the x quantity squared. And notice the minus is a part of the formula. So now we'll allow u to be e to the x. Go ahead and pause the video here, apply the formula, and then turn the video back on and we'll compare our result. This one is rather more challenging because what happens in the process of integrating is that we get a different hyperbolic inverse trig function coming out. 
So we start off by letting u be e to the x. We find du, which is e to the x dx. We don't have an e to the x, so dx becomes du over e to the x. So when we substitute, we get 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared times du over e to the x. But e to the x by definition is u, so this gives us the integral of 1 divided by u times the root of 1 minus u squared, all du. But this turns out to be um, the formula for the antiderivative negative arc siege of the absolute value of u plus a constant. So I added this formula in down here so that this one becomes negative arc siege of the absolute value of u plus c, which gives us negative arc siege of the absolute value of e to the x plus c. But we know that e to the x as a function never touches the x-axis or goes below it. So it's strictly positive. So I can drop the absolute values and write the result as negative arc siege of e to the x plus a constant. We have one last example we want to do, which is an application problem. In example 18, we want to use a catenary function to find the length of a hanging chain that has the shape given by 15 cosh of the quantity x divided by 15, where x goes between negative 20 and 20. A hanging chain, again, would be like one that you see here in the picture, where the chain is suspended under its own weight between two poles. When you do this, like on a power line, this creates a catenary function, which is a hyperbolic trig function. In this case, we want to use the hyperbolic trig function 15 cosh of x over 15 to approximate this particular hanging chain. To find arc length, remember that the formula is the integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared. In this case, we have cosh, so we want to find the derivative of cosh, which will give us cinch du dx. Go ahead and pause the video to apply the arc length formula and solve this integral application problem. Then turn the video back on so we can compare our work. Let's go ahead and take a look at this problem. Our function is 15 cosh of x over 15, so we take the derivative, which leads to cinch of x over 15 when we reduce it. Once we have that, we want to find the integrand, which is root of 1 plus f prime squared. So we need to find 1 plus f prime squared. So 1 plus f prime is cinch of x over 15, so we square it. This, however, is the hyperbolic identity, so it gives us cosh squared of x over 15. Substituting this into the integrand, we get the square root of cosh squared of x over 15, which becomes the integral of cosh of x over 15, since we know for a fact that cosh is not negative. Now we need to do a u substitution. To do the u substitution, we set u to be x over 15 so that du is dx over 15, or dx is 15 du. When we replace dx with 15 du and u with x over 15, we get 15 cosh of u du. We change the limits of integration such that when x is negative 20, negative 20 divided by 15 gives us negative 4 thirds. And when x is positive 20, we get positive 4 thirds for the u values. When we integrate cosh of u, we get cinch of u. And we evaluate this between negative 4 thirds and 4 thirds. Now, depending on the calculator that you have, you may want to look for a button on your calculator that has HYP representing hyperbolic. You hit the HYP key, then the sign key to get hyperbolic sign. Make sure when you do that, that you see in the display cinch of X, S-I-N-H. Use parentheses around your four-thirds and negative four-thirds. And when you work this out and multiply by 15, you come up with nearly 53 feet.
This is the end of our discussion on hyperbolic trig functions and their inverse functions. If you're in a regular class, you'll probably be moving on to chapter three next, where you'll discuss techniques of integration. If you're in my class, I do this one right before I do parametric and polar equations. Regardless of which type of class you're in, I hope to see you soon for the next video in the series.